I am excited to have our, uh, our three panelists uh, joining us. And um, I, I'll just uh, introduce everybody uh, quickly. I think we'll have a good discussion. We're, we're gonna focus today, our, our discussion today on preprints in general. Obviously the, the pandemic was a, was a big theme within, within this video in, in particular, but um, preprints in general and, and sort of how that relates to, um, to uh, early career scientists. And, and I think all three of our panelists are very well poised to, to talk about that. So um, first up, we, we have Jessica Polka, who uh, you all just, just saw in the video. Um, Jessica is a biochemist and executive director of ASAP Bio, which stands for Accelerating Science and Publication in Biology. Um, it's a nonprofit initiative promoting innovative and transparency uh, uh, via innovation and transparency via preprints and open peer review. Um, also a very fun fact, uh, in 2016, Polka was described in the journal Nature as an agent of change for explaining how journey, junior researchers can increase uh, the impact of their work. Um, and let's see, next up we have uh, Liz Silva from the Uni University of California, San Francisco. Um, Liz is an Associate Dean of Graduate Programs and an Adjunct Assistant Professor in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences. Um, Liz is a trained bi a biomedical research scientist with experience in science policy, particularly relating to publication and research ethics, as well as in early career training. Um, Prior to her current role, she was a senior editor at PLOS One um, and served as director of UCSF's Motivating Informed Decisions in Initiative, which reimagined the career development process for the future of the biomedical workforce. Um, and finally, we have uh, Kate Carbone. Um, she, uh, Kate is an industry postdoc um, and studies immune cell biology across scales from uh, biochemical reconstitution to in vivo tumor models. Um, she's currently focusing on cancer immunology. Um, she, Kate earned her PhD from UCSF uh, in the lab of Ron Vale and uh, published uh, preprint papers as a grad student. Uh, important to get that in there. Um, and uh, at, her, at her company now, um, Kate leads a preprint journal club uh, where she presents and summarizes find, uh, different findings um, and discusses those, those results. Um, so welcome all, all three of you. Um, I'm excited to have, have you all here. Um, I guess uh, maybe uh, before we kind of get started, um, I, I, I wanted to um, I wanted to sort of gauge what uh, what some of your reactions were after watching the video. Um, and we're we're sort of a year into some of the things that that uh, that. Um, uh, were were kind of brought up about preprints um, and about publishing during during the pandemic. Um, uh, I wonder if if um, each of you could maybe comment a little bit on um, what this past year has 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 made you think about in terms of the the publication process, um, whether that ha has to do with the pandemic specifically or or um, or just anything that that this year has brought up for you. Um, so, uh, so maybe, uh, I guess maybe, well, Jessica, we'll, we'll just start with you re real quick. <laughs> My goodness, I feel like I've already uh, yeah. occupied a space. <laughs> but thank you so much, Kevin, for the invitation. Um, yeah. and, for, for, um, and also Kate and Liz, I'm excited to have this conversation with you and all the attendees. Um, <clears throat> I think it's interesting um, to, uh, to look back on, on that video, to, you know, to some extent, many of the um, themes are, are the same, um, that they, they hold true, that there is um, a real opportunity to use preprints to increase the speed of dissemination, but there's also renewed concerns about how preprints can be used or possibly misused. Um, so for example, later um, <clears throat> in the year after uh, recording that video, we ran a survey about concerns and perceived benefits of preprints. And among people who had uh, both post preprints and those who hadn't, premature media coverage of preprints actually came out as the top concern, uh, ahead of scooping, ahead of uh, preprints being scooped by others and so mm -hmm. forth. So uh, I do think that there's a certain level of consciousness of, um, uh, you know, and a sense of responsibility among researchers um, that uh, who were the primary uh, participants in that, in that survey. Um, you know, I think that the, the concept of 
media coverage. We've seen preprint servers adapt by changing their screening policies. Um, and you know, there have been even additional review initiatives springing up during this time as well. Mm. Uh, so I, I definitely think that the system has somewhat adapted to, uh, to some of these challenges, but I'm really curious to hear uh, perspectives of others. Um, let's see. Maybe Liz, do you want to do you want to um, speak to that a little bit? Um, sure. Uh, I mean, I completely agree with Jessica that preprints have just gotten this spotlight because of the urgency of publication, and um, and I think it's a, it's a combination of the urgency, but it's also the fact that the public is become a very acutely aware this year of the full process of scientific discovery. They're following it in real time, which is something that just never happens. Um, and um, I think what's really interesting is that there are individuals who are pointing to preprint as being a problem, but it's not really preprint, it's COVID. It's COVID that's the problem. It's elevating, um, it's elevating the discourse in a way that the public and the media would not or usually see. And I don't think it's a preprint problem. It's a problem across all of peer review um, and, or, or sorry, all of, all of scientific publication, whether it's peer reviewed or not peer reviewed. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's the biggest take home that I've seen um, in in COVID. I've got lots of lots of thoughts that are pre-COVID on on preprints, but yeah, I'll leave that there. Uh, great, and and uh, Kate, what uh, what are are some of your thoughts? Yeah, I think you know Jessica and Liz really said it all. But um, this year has been uh, quite a stress test for preprints, it seems. Um, and you know, myself when I first posted preprints was in 2016. Uh, BioArchive was really just first taking off, and you know, putting your work out into the world is always a little bit scary. Um, you know, and especially as a younger scientist, when you're trying to establish your name, establish your credibility. Um, the thought of putting out work before it's ready is, um, you know, a bit intimidating. And so seeing in COVID that there's now this like hotly watched, intensely heated debate over these preprints, um, you know, it kind of, I think is, is sparking this really interesting discussion about how we share science and how we talk about science um, that, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see where it continues going. Actually, Kate, that, that Oh, no, sorry, go ahead. So I would love to add something yeah. to, to what Kate was describing, which is really interesting, um, something that I have heard over and over again. Um, the, one of the critiques of preprint is that it's not vetted. Um, but over and over again, we hear from researchers that they are actually doing a lot more vetting before they put it onto bioarchives than they ever did um, before submitting to a journal. So they're subjecting themselves to a much higher level of rigor. Um, and I've, I've heard that from students and faculty and postdocs and uh, alike. Yeah, um, Kate, I'm I'm curious uh, about you know as as a graduate student you did dis you, you did uh, publish some preprints and um, I, this is I don't I don't know a, a, a non weird way to to ask this question but I was wondering like how did you know to do that I don't think I as a, as a grad student myself I uh, like when I when I was in school I I think I only I don't think I even knew that that was could be part of the process. Um, how, like, what what went into your decision to, to sort of, uh, to go that route? Yeah, um, I mean, I think in a way, you know, I was lucky to be sort of surrounded by this conversation as it was happening. So, you know, as you said, um, I did my PhD in Ron Bale's lab. Um, I joined in 2013. I think ASAP Bio, the HHMI meeting was in 2016. Um, and I posted both of my preprints um, in 2016. So it was really, you know, that conversation about how advantageous preprints can be for your career um, in terms of communicating science quickly. Um, and, you know, Ron's paper with the data aggregated by Courtney and Walter came out around that time, also showing that this pressure on trainees to produce these sort of magnum opus style works was actually really disadvantageous um, for graduate training. So for those papers, it was really, you know, it was a total no brainer. Um, it was obvious to me that I, you know, I wanted to share that work on BioArchive. Um, I think it's been interesting now to be involved in some more collaborative projects where, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not the primary author. Maybe it's not entirely up to me whether work is published on a preprint server or not. Um, and I'm kind of learning in, in that environment where it's not taken for granted how to advocate for preprint servers. And, you know, it kind of puts the pressure on you to understand the whole 
the whole conversation and, you know, explain to your colleagues why this is a worthwhile step. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what is that uh, as, uh, now that you're um, out of school and in, in industry, what is that process like in terms of uh, making those decisions? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just learning. <laughs> I am, um, I'm a co-author on a paper uh, that was not posted on a preprint server. Um, and, you know, that decision was ultimately, you know, made by the, the corresponding author and the first author. Um, I'm preparing my own manuscript now. Um, and I would like to see that published on a preprint server. Um, but it sort of felt appropriate to kind of wait until submission. Um, and when that paper is really completely finished, then, you know, I think I feel confident bringing it up to my co-authors and, um, you know, explaining that I, you know, I think this is a really great way to communicate science. Um, and as Liz mentioned, you know, we have our own internal review processes. First of all, you know, all of the authors on the paper are reading it um, with their most critical eyes. You know, we have other people in the department who are looking at it. Um, Genentech also has a legal review process before work can be disclosed. Um, so, you know, by the time we would be ready to put that work on bioarchive, you know, I'm going to feel quite confident in it. Uh, um, one of the things I was, uh, that I was sort of curious about as well was, um, I mean, in the video, it sort of talked, we talked, uh, Jessica, you talked a little bit about, um, what some of the benefits are um, to publishing uh, publishing a, a preprint. Um, I'm curious, uh, sort of focusing on that sort of early career stage, there's some unique uh, unique things about whether you decide to do that or not do that. And, and I'm sure, you know, especially when you're earlier on, you're, you're very heavily swayed by whoever your advisor is and what their opinion might be. Um, I, I'm just wondering if you have anything to add about, about that. Um. Yeah, definitely. I think I think that you know Kate really um, you know hit the nail on the head with this point about the graduate the timeline of graduate education but compared to the timeline of papers uh, and especially the, the timeline of the review process. So um, you know I think it's really interesting to uh, Kate referenced this uh, paper that Ron uh, published in, in 2015. You know, to some extent, I think the reason that it's taking graduate students such a long time to publish a paper, as Kate mentioned, is because the, these papers now have um, a uh, multiplier of the number of figures than they did 30 years ago. There's just expectation of tons and tons of work to go into a single paper. So when, you know, preprints are posted um, at the time of submission, they definitely help with that uh, to some extent because you are making the work public ahead of this journal review process. Um, but I do think that there still are fundamental challenges in the way that we communicate research um, that are not being addressed by this, this practice. That said, I do feel like, um, I, and I, I'm curious really to hear Kate's um, kind of strategies and what's worked um, in the past, but. You know, I think that um, I, as a postdoc, I had the real benefit of my, my postdoc advisor, Pam Silver, was actually on the advisory board of BioArchive, so she was very supportive at all times as well. But in my own, you know, experience talking to um, people who perhaps are not yet preprint supporters or advocates, I think it's really compelling to show support from funders, support from colleagues who are also posting preprints to have one-on-one -on -one conversations to understand what the, um, what the benefits are. So, you know, in, I would love to hear from Kate um, as well uh, uh, to speak to this, but I, you know, I certainly think that for early career researchers, there's a huge benefit, but there's also this challenge of um, being in a position where there might be power dynamics where you're not the only one calling the shots about where, what happens with your paper. Um, so I think that arming um, uh, yourself with information about uh, policy surrounding preprints, about the usage of preprints, the potential benefits. I'll drop a link into the chat um, with some resources. Uh, but I think that you know, be, bringing that data can can only be helpful. Um, Liz, I was I was curious from your perspective as well as someone that. Um you know, helps, uh, helps so many uh, early career scientists um, where, 
you know, the, your, your own decisions about, about preprints as well as um, what, what kinds of advising you give to, to folks that are earlier on in their career surrounding that as well. Yeah, absolutely. This is, um, you know, this honestly falls in a bigger bucket of, of conversations that uh, trainees have to have with their advisors on um, what serves their own best interests versus what the PIs um, believe are their interests of, of their trainees or in the interest of the lab or the interest of their, their funding sources. Um, and this, this really moves honestly into a phase of a bit of a negotiation if you're dealing with somebody who's particularly recalcitrant. Um, uh, there's definitely the, um, there's the policy aspect, um, which I think kind of speaks to um, the trainee um, sharing their, what, what they value as a researcher as part of their identity as a researcher, what they value in the work that they do. Um, and, you know, that's sort of the, the public responsibility. And if that's really important to you, then communicating that as a value that you have as a researcher is definitely important. Um, in addition, I think that there is a, a process where um, you have a conversation about the pros and cons of preprint um, for the PI and for the student. And so it's, a, it's going in with um, what are your professional objectives? What are your career objectives? What will the preprint do for you that's important to you? Uh, what will the preprint do for the, the PI um, that will meet their objectives in increasing the profile? Um, one small tidbit that I think is really helpful for people to bear in mind in all of these conversations is, again, there's a perception that putting out your preprint will subject you to scooping, um, but there's a lot of indication that it's actually the reverse because you put your name out there first. And so um, a paper will get submitted to a peer-reviewed um, journal with the uh, increased profile of bioarchive. There's a very, very good chance that an editor or reviewers will know that that work has already been published in the preprint server and they'll want to know why that wasn't cited or how did you come about it. So. Um, so that's one, one little tip for the negotiation process. But I think it's really a negotiation of, of what's important to you and for your objectives and why. And, and sort of just as a follow-up, I wonder, do you know um, how, you know, for, for someone that's sort of look, that's looking for their next opportunity in science, um, which, you know, that can be many different t types of things. Do you think, how, how are preprints viewed on like a CV of a potential candidate or or from a selection committee or, or something like that. Is that, um, I'm sure that's something that, that may, may be changing as well, but I, I wonder if, if Liz, maybe you could, could comment on that a little bit. Um, yeah, um, and it's very complicated and I agree. Um, you, you hit it on the head there, Kevin. It is changing absolutely as a preprint gain um, traction and profile. I think it is changing. Um, it depends on the type of career that you are going for. There are still very traditional agencies, very traditional funders that want to see um, peer-reviewed papers. Um, there is an enormous misconception that the coin of the realm is a peer-reviewed published paper, regardless of the career that you're going into. Any faculty member who tells you that is incorrect. <laughs> I guarantee you, you did not get into patent law because of your nature paper, I promise. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and uh, I'm seeing uh, much more frequently um, when students or postdocs advocate for um, getting their work out there in preprints is because they have a better understanding of the uh, what it is that the employers are looking for. So part of that negotiation becomes a conversation about what their their career objectives are. I want to move into science policy. I want to move into industry. Um, and having that research in your back pocket about what those future employees or those future career uh, opportunities are actually looking for becomes part of that negotiation and part of that ammunition you have when having a conversation. Um, the best way to determine that would be to do informational interviews with, um, you know, as you're thinking about what you want to do and what your career objectives are, regardless of trajectory. If, you know, if you want to do a postdoc, don't assume you know what people are looking for in a postdoc. Um, have, have uh, engage in, uh, with people who are in the labs that you want to work in, in the in, uh, industry or in the companies that you want to work with um, and find out what um, they are looking for. Um, in, in hiring somebody. Can I just um, add on to that, which I think is an uh, um, excellent point. Um, I think that there is a, uh, it, there, people are posting, uh, well, preprints are, for example, at BioArchive by definition prior to journal acceptance. So I definitely think that even for these um, careers that Liz is mentioning where, of course, it, you know, peer review is valuable. Um, you know, I think that, you know, for, 
uh, the peer review process, I would argue, is valuable, um, you know, regard outside of the uh, the process of looking for a job as well. Um, but I think that there is no, um, this is not an either or dichotomy that you can, you can post a preprint and, um, you know, to my knowledge, there are really no, uh, you know, many of the journals that were previously hesitant about preprints or had reservations about preprints have changed their policies in the last few years. So it, preprints are really something that you can add on to the journal publishing process. And um, while some people may want to leave their work as a preprint and not take it forward, um, there's no reason that you have to decide uh, between those two options. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I completely well agree. Didn't mean to mislead. Uh, go ahead. Um, <laughs> if I can add as well, in terms of um, you know the job application process, I recently had the opportunity to help review applications for the Genentech postdoc program, yeah. um, and you know I think it is really helpful, especially as a graduate student, if your paper is in revision. You know, if you write uh, in press or in revision on a CV, it's hard to know what that means. Whereas if you put a bioarchive link, like for one, that means I can take a look at that research and understand what you're doing. And, you know, given that I am, you know, a big fan of preprints myself, it's also a little bit of value signaling that, you know, as Liz kind of mentioned, I look at that and I say like, oh, wow, this person is really passionate about open science, about collaboration, about, you know, being a part of a community and, um, you know, if you get the right person, I think that really can elicit a very positive, um, a very positive response. Um, myself, I've never seen anyone upset about a preprint being on a CV. You know, you're never going to get a negative response because you're including that. Um, but you have this potential really significant upside of, you know, finding an ally in whatever job you're applying for. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to make sure we we hit on as well was about um, just about kind of the strategy of reading preprints. I think even you know even learning learning how to read scientific literature with like a critical eye is is such a major part of of scientific training, and doing it with with uh, preprints requires even a little bit more like another level of nuance. And I think we've talked about it in the context of you know, journalism covering preprint stuff like that. But I think for for someone who is learning as a scientist, uh, I, I'm wondering how if, if uh, any of you have have any thoughts about sort of strategies for thinking about how you read read a preprint or or um, or, you know, training others in, in terms of how, how to do that. Well, just briefly, I'll say that I think that one thing that is available for preprints that is not necessarily available for uh, peer, uh, peer review journal articles is that people are much more willing to, um, I think, discuss and comment on preprints. So something like 5% of bioarchive preprints have comments in the commenting section and more have tweets that reference them. Oftentimes they say things like cool paper, but you know, there's often uh, substantive comments there. Um, whereas when an article is kind of finally published in a paper, there's less of a opportunity and need, I think, for people to comment publicly. Perhaps that's one reason why, um, in general, there's, you know, the 5% of bioarchive is actually quite high compared to, you know, existing common counts on, on journal websites or uh, PubMed Commons with, you know, when that experiment was running. So I think that it's one thing that could be helpful is to look for, um, you know, other comments and uh, reactions on other peer review sites on Twitter, in the comment section of BioArchive. And of course, uh, it's important to read with a grain of salt, but it could be that some people bring expertise that is unique and provides a different lens on the preprint. Um, so that's certainly one difference aside from, as you mentioned, um, perhaps this increased skepticism. Uh, yeah, um, I. Uh, that's post-publication post peer review, right? Um, and uh, one thing that's really interesting is that I'm increasingly seeing uh, preprints being used as a training tool um, for postdocs and, and students to learn how to critically evaluate, how to be reviewers in the peer review system. Um, so a lot of um, a lot of programs, a lot of T32 programs in particular, um, are or um, PhD programs generally, they're incorporating preprints into their training of of students on how to read the scientific literature um, and how to evaluate those critically. I think they, they do some tricks like maybe hide the comments until afterwards, or they don't tell them where the final paper was published and then they can reveal the final, the final changes. But um, 
yeah, it's been it's been a really interesting tool for actually learning how to be a peer reviewer. Yeah, I think I've also learned a lot about how to be a better scientist by reading preprints. Um, so I do a, a monthly review of preprints with my lab um, and it's hard. Um, so there's a ton of content, you know, I start with having keyword alerts, um, you know, that come into my inbox and there's just an absolute flood of papers, which can be a little intimidating. Um, and then I try to, you know, narrow things down by titles that are really in my discipline. Um, I do find with preprints, I tend not to read outside of my immediate discipline as much as I do, maybe looking at journal articles. Um, and then from there, you know, something I'm really grappling with is that I lean very heavily on who the authors are. Um, do I know them? Where are they from? Have I heard them speak at conferences? Um, which is not the best way uh, to, you know, triage good science, but because there's so much content on bioarchive, you know, I find that that's hard to avoid. Um, and then we talk in a group. Um, and so I think, you know, once I've kind of gone through those steps of sort of applying these filters, um, uh, you know, we talk about the work, um, we talk about whether we think it's robust, we talk about what it means for our science and that, um, that I think is really the most exciting. And then to see, you know, where a paper comes out at the end after we've, you know, looked at it at BioArchive is also really, really interesting to kind of see what the rest of the field thought compared to what we concluded. Uh, actually, that uh, Kate, that sort of gets at another th another thing I was curious about with um, the just the sheer volume of information that's out there. I actually I always think about so when I was in grad school, my advisor told me when he was in grad school, he would go to the library every Sunday and he would grab the journals from his field and he would get caught up on the literature and like that's how he did it, um, which is obviously not how I had to do it and not how anyone is able to do it anymore. There's just so many journals and then, and, and also so many places where, where, um, you know, where work can, can end up. Um, I, I guess I'm wondering one, one thing I'm wondering about is wh whether, um, whether, you know, how, how you, um, kind of, um, I guess you know, like there's there's so much work that's out there. Like, do you think more or fewer people read preprints, or is that not 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 relevant, or is it the who is reading it that's more important? Uh, I, I wonder. Maybe Kate and and uh, I I see Jessica nodding her head as well. Maybe both of you could comment as well. Yeah, um, so I have kind of maybe two different perspectives. You know, the first is that I came from cell biology at UCSF, where I think they were extremely early adopters of preprints. And I think my peers in cell biology, check bioarchive, you know, are more likely to be on Twitter. Um, now I'm working in cancer immunology, and I think that that field is maybe a little bit slower to pick up preprints. Um, Again, I haven't encountered any hostility towards preprints, but it's not something that's on people's minds um, the way I found it was in cell biology. So, um, you know, when I'm presenting papers, I think it's it's really impactful because people see their peers who are, you know, maybe big name labs that are presenting or that are publishing preprints and it kind of normalizes the whole process. But I, I don't think yet, um, you know, the majority of cancer immunologists are reading bioarchive on a regular basis, the way that might be true in cell biology. Again, this is just my own personal impression. So I can't say this is true for sure, but um, it's hard. And yeah, it feels like with reading journal articles as well, there's some level of randomness for what work you're gonna see and what work you're not gonna see and leaning on your colleagues to help keep you up to date and in the loop, um, it has to be a group effort. Yeah, I definitely agree about the challenge of Kate. And I think to uh, build on what you said as well, Kevin, um, there's a paper from Rich Abdel looking at uh, kind of metrics, usage, usage metrics of bioarchive papers. And um, interestingly, in the first month of posting, there was actually higher per article views in like say 2016 than there are now, even though of course, um, yeah, the views are, it's not a dramatic decrease, but I do think that what is happening is there's a little bit of dilution of the fact that it used to be you could go to bioarchive, open up one of the subject collections, 
and browse through all the papers um, in a couple of minutes. Now the preprints are becoming more widespread that the rate of preprint posting is approximately 8% of the total literature on, on uh, PubMed, that uh, we need to adapt away from this kind of journal table of contents style approach, which frankly, it sounds like still works for physics uh, because you know, physicists will talk about perusing archive over the morning cup of coffee. Um, but I think that you know, for us uh, or for researchers who are more kind of focused in uh, the, the biology space, that um, keywords kind of alerts are gonna be the way that people learn about preprints moving forward. So certainly preprints will show up in Google Scholar alerts. There are tools like Meta, um, Semantic Scholar that can help find and alert uh, you to preprints based on you know, various different algorithms or AI. The fact that preprints are now being indexed on um, PubMed in a trial of COVID-19 relevant preprints by NIH authors and Europe PMC, which is a uh, European mirror of PubMed has been actually capturing the full text of preprints um, for about two years now. And so they are really a fantastic resource if you wanna set up alerts um, that include preprints in a way that you could digest along with other journal articles. Uh, but I think this is a huge problem. Um, and you know, as the number of preprint servers um, increases, uh, it only heightens the need for better discovery strategies. So, well, let's see, one, one question that's come in about um, reading um, outside your discipline, is there, why, why would or wouldn't you re read preprints outside of your discipline? Is it a, a volume thing or expertise thing? Or, or um, yeah, I think I think Kate, uh, maybe Kate, you had mentioned it, and Jessica, you were also nodding about it as well. <laughs> yeah. So again, because of this volume problem, I think that's really why I just don't have the bandwidth to be, you know, searching um, searching outside my discipline terribly often. Um, whereas in a journal, when there's only a few articles, it's just easier to see that research right in front of you. Um, so predominantly my reading outside my discipline on preprint servers is because it's work done by my friends. Um, and, you know, I, I rely on other tools. Um, it's not necessarily that there's that additional level of peer review. It's just simply a, a volume of content issue. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree. I think that, you know, for me, um, it, peer review is not perfect uh, by any, you know, stretch of the imagination, but I do find myself, um, you know, reading an, an, uh, a journal article outside my field, um, I mean, there is some sense that it has passed more sense checks um, than a preprint. Um, it's also, I think, important to know that uh, preprint servers have different screening strategies. So for example, MedArchive has a pretty involved screening process. They're checking for um, you know, conflict of interest, uh, et cetera. Um, there are preprint servers um, that don't have any, or I should say places you can find preprints, um, maybe it's even more broad category, where there is no pre-screening uh, except perhaps like a spam check. Um, and you know, I think that this is, um, you know, that's not to say that content posted on MedArchive has been through peer review, um, but just just as a, a little sidebar that, um, you know, there's a, a whole range of, of, of different levels of scrutiny that work can undergo, both within journals and on preprint servers. Um, Liz, uh, there's another question that has come in that maybe uh, you might be well poised to, to talk about, which is it, um, you'd, you'd mentioned um, how uh, sort of the your values and your goals and everything in, in your career might dictate whether you're um, uh, where, where you want to publish things or how you want to publish things. Um, I'm wondering if you have any advice or, or if you've, you've offered thoughts to others about um, when those that that those values don't align with who your supervisor is, um, strategies of of sort of getting around that or or working through that. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? I think the real question there is, what do you do if your PI is willing to ignore your values? 
<laughs> which is a much more <laughs> difficult question. Yeah. Um, certainly, certainly it's very common for it to not be aligned, but um, hopefully you're working with somebody who respects you as a person and wants to see how you can come into alignment, which is why I refer to it as a negotiation. Um, it's a lot more difficult if somebody wants to ignore those values. Um, you know, with, with a student, I think it's a little bit, um, there are better support structures in place um, because you have a dissertation committee. Um, I, the hope is that you've got um, a group of faculty on your dissertation committee that includes at least one person who is willing to be an advocate and support for you as a professional without a, you know, there's, there's an inherent conflict of interest between the student and a, and a PI. They've got their own um, objectives. They've got their own needs too, right? They're trying to, they're trying to keep their own small company running. Mm -hmm. um, and those needs don't necessarily align with what the individual's career objectives are, but hopefully on your, your dissertation committee, there's, there's somebody who is there to advocate for you. Um, so relying on those other, um, other mentors, other uh, advisors and other advocates, um, I think it's probably the best way to go. Um, but when somebody's not willing to listen, it's tough. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm returning returning to my question list now. But um, uh, oh yeah, actually, the, the uh, Kate and Jessica have either of you had? I, it sounds like Kate, um, you you had a, a very good and supportive experience. But I wonder, uh, as a grad student at least, I wonder uh, what what the process has been like to sort of advocate for preprints or advocate just for your values or surrounding preprints um, outside of your grad and grad experience. Yeah, um, I mean, to be honest, I'm a bit nervous to do it. Um, so I think I have um, established that I care a lot about preprints. You know, my mentors know that I'm doing this journal club. Um, you know, they know that I'm here today. <laughs> And so I don't imagine it will come as a surprise that um, for my first or co-first author work that I would like to see that printed or published on a preprint server. But, you know, I do feel like I'm in a position where I need to be a knowledgeable advocate for preprint publication. Um, and so that's been intimidating. I'll probably go check out the ASAP bio website to, you know, refresh myself on statistics. Um, and we're having a conversation within the postdoc program to try and have some more institutional recommendations to encourage preprint publications so that individual postdocs can sort of be armed with that endorsement. Um, I don't know how it goes. I don't you know, particularly know now working in a space where we're dealing with some human clinical trial data, if there'll be additional, um, additional conversations that come up because of that. Uh, there's just a lot of different stakeholders at play now and I'll have to see how that goes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely uh, hear you, Kate, that I, I think at um, any time that you are proposing changing the status quo or making any sort of um, innovations, that can, you know, I think people begin to, there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, reaction for good reason and valid concern that, you know, I think Liz mentioned this idea of like, really, let's, let's like sit together, get on both sides, get them on the same side of the table and really talk about what the potential pros and cons are. Um, but I do believe that um, for preprints, there are some fears that are certainly brought up. And I do think that you know, it's possible that preprints are not the right solution for every team, um, for every project. You know, for example, I know that you know, BioArchive has um, you know, not basically uh, temporarily halted the posting of certain types of research for public health concerns. You know, so I think that there's, it is really important to bring this, I think, sensitivity um, to, to concerns. Um, but I do feel that ultimately, if we think about what researchers are trying to do, we're trying to build knowledge. And the only way to do that is by sharing it and by getting feedback that ultimately will strengthen uh, our own work. Um, you know, I think that, you know, from my own experience, the last, um, I continue to post these sort of like, you know, uh, non-biology preprints, but the last like biology preprint um, I posted, um, you know, I think that it was a really valuable experience. We've actually posted it ahead of submitting to a journal um, by about a month or two and 
got really helpful feedback uh, on the preprint from a colleague that we had known, um, although certainly it, it's not unheard of to have uh, completely unsolicited uh, feedback as well. Uh, and we also got an invitation to submit uh, the article to a journal. And so, you know, I think that while it, that has not happened for every single preprint, I think that it is really, um, there. It, there's not a lot of downside, but a lot of potential for lots of good to come from it. And that I, I you know, find is um, a message that um, can, can be helpful to convey. Uh, another question that's come in about, uh, about that process is the, the review of preprints is, is obviously more public than, than peer review is, you know, like you, you, you get to just look at your own reviewer comments and feel, feel good or bad about yourself in your own private way. But if there's, uh, you know, comments or social media about preprints in that way, um, things become a lot more, a more public in that way. Um, I wonder if, if any of you have had any experience with, with sort of having to deal with that more public layer of, of scrutiny with, with work um, that's in a preprint. Yeah, I mean, I can just say that um, in this case, you know, the comments, I think that the there's actually been a survey by BioArchive conducted, I think in 2018, where they found that something like 40% of preprint authors have received private feedback by email hmm. on their preprint, which is, you know, almost a factor in order of magnitude higher than the number that are getting comments um, <laughs> on, on their papers. Actually, I think that, you know, for this study, the, the authors posted multiple preprints. I mean, the point being, there's a lot more private feedback than public feedback. Ideally, we would live in a universe where um, it would be kind of normal to have civil public critique of papers, because ultimately, this critique is really necessary um, in cases where there's other people, you know, as we've been talking about, who are reading that preprint, who need to have that context of understanding which parts of this are, um, you know, deserve more attention and more inquiry, what parts are credible, and so forth. Um, I, you know, I think that there's uh, uh, definitely a, a one, one thing that I think can alleviate these concerns is the fact that there are these sort of organized peer review initiatives, for example, at Johns Hopkins, at Oxford, at Mount Sinai, um, who are, and also groups like Peer Community In, who are organizing a peer review process. So there is this um, idea of having this edit you know, an editorial layer to ensure that the comments are um, civil and you know, constructive as they're being posted publicly. Um, I actually have an extra question for Jessica in case you might know the answer to this, because um, it strikes me there's two things here. There's public versus private, and then there's also anonymous versus identifiable. Mm -hmm. um, and so the reviewers have different motivations depending on all of those things as well. Um, and I know that people have been looking for a long time at signed peer review versus anonymous peer review. Do you have any insight into how that affects the tone and the content of the reviewers? Yeah, I mean, I uh, I don't actually, um, I'm not actually aware off the top of my head of studies that compare these two things. Um, although um, I do know uh, the study of you know publishing peer review um, and the effect of that. I'd also love to hear your perspective on this and also K2. I mean, I think the key tension with requiring signed peer review is whether people feel comfortable possibly critiquing um, someone who is senior to them yeah, I think that there are some potential, um, it would definitely, I think, change the dynamic between <laughs> reviewers and authors. People might feel more responsible for what they're saying and less likely to be critical, but, but at the same time, um, you know, it, it does raise issues about kind of uh, trying to garner favor from an individual um, and people might fear retribution as well. So, um, I, 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 it's, it's a very complicated issue. And again, it's one where I wish that, you know, in this utopia, we would all feel comfortable to attach our names. But I, I don't, I think that moving to a system of that nature prematurely would disadvantage certain groups of people disproportionately. Yeah, I think, and Jessica would know these statistics better than me, but I think at this point, if you're getting peer review on your preprint, you're one of the lucky ones. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a good tool to share with colleagues. Um, 
one of my preprints was actually cited. Um, and I remember when I was a grad student and that happened, I was like, oh my God, this person is reading my paper. <laughs> um, you know, and so that felt really cool. Um, you know, I also want to share that there was an interpretation of one of the results in my preprint that actually changed um, because of peer review, because of additional experiments. And, you know, that's on the internet <laughs> um, and that happens. And that's, you know, that's real. Um, I would imagine that those kinds of things are much more common than having someone, one of your colleagues, like tear your work apart. Um, or even, you know, to be lucky enough to get like really detailed commentary that you might get from a journal or from review commons or from a formal review process. Um, I think most people aren't taking the time to provide that kind of feedback to very many preprints at all. Great. Well, we are we're winding down on our, our hour. Um, I, I do want to thank all three of you for joining us. Um, this has been been really, really helpful uh, uh, conversation. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we we're really looking forward to having more events like this uh, into the future and more more videos like this into the future as well. So um, yeah, uh, Jessica, Liz, and Kate, I really want to thank thank all three of you for joining us and and for really uh, expanding the impact of of uh, of this uh, this video. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.